In the next OBGYN section, I'll discuss some of the high yield complications of labor and delivery, including prolonged latent stage, protracted cervical dilation, arrest disorders, malpresentation, shoulder dystocia, and postpartum hemorrhage. We'll start with a case presentation. We have a 22-year-old who comes in at 39 weeks gestation with spontaneous ruptured membranes. Her cervical exam at outset is 3 centimeters, and over 3 hours she progresses to 5 centimeters. Over the next 6 hours, she remains 5 centimeters, and we're asked what the most likely diagnosis is. Given these options, the correct answer is arrest of cervical dilation, which is no dilation of the cervix for more than 2 hours in patients who are in the active stage of labor or who have a cervix greater than 4 centimeters. A prolonged latent stage will be one that takes more than 20 hours in a first-time mom in order to reach 4 centimeters dilation. Protracted cervical dilation is when the first-time mom does not have dilation of the cervix greater than 1.2 centimeters an hour in active labor. An arrest of descent is when the fetal head does not move down in the birth canal. Here are a few important definitions in order to be able to answer these step two questions. The prolonged latent stage is a latent phase greater than 20 hours in first time moms and greater than 14 hours in moms who've had babies before. The etiology can be that of sedation, an unfavorable cervix, or uterine dysfunction with irregular or weak contractions. The treatment of prolonged latent phase of labor is pretty conservative and involves rest and hydration. The majority will convert to spontaneous labor and delivery within 6 to 12 hours. Protracted cervical dilation occurs in stage 1 of labor during the active phase greater than about 4 centimeters. This is diagnosed when there's less than 1.2 centimeters an hour in a primiparous patient or less than 1.5 centimeters an hour in a multiparous patient. The etiology here is the famous three P's, power, or the strength and frequency of contractions, and as discussed, we can assess that with an intrauterine pressure device, as well as measuring Montevideo units. The passenger, so the size and position of the fetus, this may be due to macrosomia, or weight greater than 4,000 to 4,500 grams. The fetal position, which may be due to an asynclitic head position, an extended position causing brow or face presentation, or a fetus in the occiput posterior position, as well as a compound presentation, or a fetus that's also presenting with a, with a fetal part in addition to the head. Finally, the passage, or the size of the pelvis. This is cephalopelvic disproportion, and can be assisted with clinical pelvimetry, which is the manual evaluation of the diameter of the pelvis. So treatment of protracted labor is geared towards the three P's. The one we have most control over is power. We can affect the power and uterine contractions by adding Pitocin in order to make contractions stronger and more frequent. We can also perform an amniotomy. There's a little controversy here as it's been shown to reduce labor by up to two hours, but some studies have not shown any difference in cesarean section rate. The passenger and the pelvis we can really only truly affect by performing a cesarean section and bypassing the outlet. We'll briefly define the arrest disorders. The arrest of cervical dilation, as we mentioned from our case study, involves no cervical dilation for two hours. The arrest of fetal descent is no fetal descent for one hour, and this is after the cervix is completely dilated and the patient has been pushing for one hour. The etiology of arrest of descent overlaps somewhat with our other arrest disorders, as does the treatment. Cephalopelvic disproportion accounts for about half of all arrest disorders. The only way to treat this is to perform a cesarean section. Excessive sedation or anesthesia can also be a cause, and you can reverse this by either resting the patient and giving the patient time or reversing the anesthetic agent. Malposition, such as asynclitism of the head, occipital posterior position, or face or brow presentation, is treated with time, 
an operative delivery or forceps in order to move the baby into the correct position, or a cesarean section. So let's look at how malpresentation might appear on the Step 2 exam. We have a 25-year-old who's at 35 weeks gestation and on physical exam has a hard circular surface felt in the upper part of the abdomen. What of the following is the next best step? Given these options, ultrasound should always be done when you're concerned about malpresentation in order to confirm the location of the fetus. We should always perform an ultrasound in order to confirm the location before offering therapeutic measures, such as external cephalic version. CT and x-ray are avoided during pregnancy due to radiation exposure when possible. So we've used the term presenting part before, and it's defined as the part of the fetal body that's closest to the vaginal canal, and thus will be engaged in the pelvis when labor starts. If it's cephalic, it means the head is the engaged part, whereas a malpresentation includes any of the other parts, most commonly the foot or the buttock. The diagnosis of malpresentation can be accomplished on physical examination using Leopold maneuvers, which are a set of four maneuvers that estimate the fetal weight and also the presenting part, or on vaginal exam, where you may not feel that normal hard surface of the skull is the presenting part. As we mentioned, ultrasound is the gold standard for diagnosing malpresentation. And on the Step 2 exam, you should always confirm a suspected diagnosis on physical examination with an ultrasound. The Step 2 exam might ask you about the different types of breech presentation, and we'll discuss them here. The first is frank breech presentation, where the fetus's hips are flexed and the knees are extended bilaterally in the pike position. A complete breech presentation or the fetus's hips and knees are both flexed bilaterally. A footling breach is when the fetus is feet first. You can either have one leg or a single footling, or both legs a double footling. Here we have a fetus in the frank breach position. Note the hips are flexed and the knees are extended bilaterally. This is a complete breach presentation with both the hips and knees flexed. Finally, we have a footling breach, with the foot being present at the birth canal. There are two options for treatment of malpresentation. The first is external cephalic version, in which the caregiver maneuvers the fetus into a cephalic presentation or a head down position through the abdominal wall. This procedure should not be performed before 36 weeks gestation, as the fetus often will spontaneously convert to a cephalic presentation before 36 weeks. This procedure is successful in approximately 50% of appropriately selected individuals. The other option in this case is cesarean delivery. We've discussed shoulder dystocia in previous sections and went over the high yield complications of brachial plexus injuries. Here, we'll discuss what to do if you're faced with a shoulder dystocia on the Step 2 exam or in clinical practice. A shoulder dissocia is entrapment of the anterior shoulder behind the pubic symphysis after delivery of the fetal head. This diagram shows how the anterior shoulder can get stuck behind the pubic symphysis and can be helpful to visualize as we discuss the maneuvers to relieve the shoulder dystocia. There are several risk factors for shoulder dystocia, which involve maternal diabetes, maternal obesity, post-term pregnancy, or a history of prior shoulder dystocia. Remember any factor that indicates the fetus is too big for the pelvis or the pelvis is too small for the baby is a risk factor for shoulder dystocia. You may see the first signs of a shoulder dystocia as the fetal head is delivering and then retracts against the perineum, known as the turtle sign. If you suspect the shoulder dystocia, follow these maneuvers. First is McRoberts maneuver. Here we see a depiction of McRoberts maneuver, which is hyperflexion at the hips, allowing for the obstetrical conjugate to be its widest. Along with McRoberts maneuver is suprapubic pressure, and this is pressure directly behind the pubic symphysis in order to dislodge the anterior shoulder. If this is unsuccessful, we can attempt Rubin's maneuver. This maneuver is accomplished 
by pushing the most accessible shoulder towards the anterior surface of the fetal chest. This maneuver most often results in abduction of both shoulders, which in turn produces a smaller shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder diameter. This permits the displacement of the anterior shoulder from behind the pubic symphysis. If Rubin's maneuver is unsuccessful, we can employ Wood's maneuver, which is rotation of the fetus's shoulders by pushing the posterior shoulder towards the fetal back. After this, we can try delivery of the posterior arm in order to decrease the diameter that has to pass through the pelvis. If all these are unsuccessful, you can discuss fracturing the fetal clavicle. And finally, performing a Zavinelli maneuver, which is pushing the fetal head back into the uterus to perform a cesarean delivery. When we get to this point, there's a very high rate of both maternal and fetal mortality, and this is the last maneuver to try. Postpartum hemorrhage is a common presentation both on the clinical wards and on the Step 2 exam. Worldwide, maternal deaths occur usually within 24 hours of delivery, most commonly from excessive bleeding. The sequelae of postpartum hemorrhage involves respiratory distress syndrome, coagulopathy, shock, and pituitary necrosis, or Sheehan syndrome. Sheehan syndrome is a favorite presentation on the Step 2 exam and presents with an inability to breastfeed with a history of a large postpartum hemorrhage. There is a physiologic connection here in that the lactotrophs, which produce prolactin, are the first cells of the pituitary to die during a watershed infarct after a large blood loss. A postpartum hemorrhage is defined as bleeding more than 500 milliliters after delivery. Hemorrhages can be defined as either early or late. Early postpartum hemorrhages occur within 24 hours of delivery, whereas late postpartum hemorrhages occur between 24 hours and 12 weeks after delivery. There are a number of different etiologies. First is uterine atony, A meaning without, tony meaning contractions. Normally, postpartum, the uterine contractions compress the blood vessels to stop blood loss. With uterine atony, this doesn't occur, and atony is the most common cause of postpartum hemorrhage, accounting for about 80% of the cases. Some other common etiologies involve a laceration of the cervix or vagina, retained products of conception, or coagulopathy. Given that uterine atony is such an important cause of postpartum hemorrhage, we'll discuss some of the risk factors that you'll easily recognize it on the Step 2 exam. Some anesthetic agents prevent adequate contractions or effective contractions of the uterus and can cause atony. If the uterus has been overdescended prior to delivery, it may have a tough time contracting down. This is seen in macrosomic babies, twins, or moms who have had polyhydramnios. Atony is also seen in prolonged or rapid labors. If the labor has been augmented for a prolonged period of time, the pitocin receptors may not be highly functioning and may have a tough time effectively contracting the uterus after delivery. If uterine leiomyoma are there, the uterus may not contract down well because of a mechanical dystocia. Mothers who have had Preeclampsia with magnesium therapy also are at risk for atony as magnesium present, prevents smooth muscle contractions in the uterus. Evaluation and treatment of postpartum hemorrhage is systematic. If you have a patient who presents with a postpartum hemorrhage on the Step 2 exam, you should first examine the perineum, vagina, and cervix in order to rule out a laceration. Next, a bimanual exam is done in order to ensure there's no rupture of the uterus and that there are no retained products. If the examination is unremarkable, a bimanual compression and massage should be done and this will control most cases of postpartum bleeding. If this is unsuccessful, we can administer uterotonics and there's a number of ones that are commonly used. Examples include oxytocin, methyl ergonavine malleate or methergen, 15-methyl prostaglandin F2-alpha, or hemabate, or mizoprostol, or cytotec. The Step 2 examination may test you further on these drugs. It's important to remember that methergen is contraindicated in patients with hypertension, and hemabate cannot be given to asthmatics. Mizoprostol is not contraindicated in either hypertensives or asthmatics. Next comes operative managements.
If the woman is stable, you can consider performing a uterine artery embolization, provided there is interventional radiology personnel and facilities available. A dilation and curatage can be performed if retained products of conception are suspected. A Bakri balloon can be placed, which is a collapsed balloon that is similar to a very large Foley, inserted into the uterus and filled with fluid in order to tamponade the vessels. A B Lynch stitch can be placed, which is a compression stitch, or you can consider a uterine artery ligation. If all of these are unsuccessful, the ultimate and definitive treatment is a hysterectomy. In order to better characterize some of the operative managements, we have examples of the B Lynch stitch here on the left. These are compression stitches that go all the way around the uterus and then are cinched down in order to provide external compression. The uterine artery ligation involves ligation of the uterine vessels at the level of the cervicoismic junction. So we've discussed the systematic evaluation and treatment of postpartum hemorrhage. One of the most important things in all of this is to recall some of the therapeutic measures which may be necessary in a large hemorrhage. Blood products in the form of packed red blood cells, fresh frozen plasma, and cryoprecipitate may need to be given. I'm going to discuss some of the different types of blood products, their contents, and the effects, as this is high yield on both the obstetric section as well as other areas of the Step 2 exam. First, packed red blood cells contains primarily red blood cells, a few white blood cells, and plasma. This should serve to increase the hematocrit by 3% and the hemoglobin by 1 gram per deciliter. Fresh frozen plasma contains soluble plasma proteins, including factors 5, 7, fibrinogen, and antithrombin 3. It should serve to increase the fibrinogen by 10 milligrams per deciliter and should be given if the PT or PTT is greater than 1.5 times the upper limit of normal, or in settings of massive transfusion. Cryoprecipitate includes factors 8, 13, fibrinogen, fibronectin, and von Willebrand's factor. This also serves to increase fibrinogen by 10 milligrams per deciliter, but is a smaller volume than FFP and should be given if fibrinogen is very low. Finally, we have platelets which includes primarily platelets with some RBCs and WBCs, as well as plasma. This serves to increase the platelet levels by 5,000 to 10,000 millimeters cubed per unit. 